Good morning. So good to see you today. You sound great. You look great. Let's worship our great God together, shall we? Continue to worship our great God together. Please turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. And really, verse 9, I told you last week as we were going through verses 1 through uh, 14 that I wasn't skipping verse 9. I was leaving it to have sort of the spotlight by itself, which is today. So now we will be circling back to that passage. I was reminded this morning during our new members class that from Byron that this passage has sparked some controversy even here at Providence Baptist, formerly Fifth Avenue Baptist, that several years ago it was during a Sunday school class that this very verse was read and, there, and the dividing line was drawn of those who interpreted it this way and those who interpreted it that way. So uh, this passage is an often misquoted misused passage of scripture and it's often used as a crowbar leveled against the scriptures and those who hold to the scriptures clear teaching of election that is of God's sovereignty in salvation and what I hope to do this morning humbly uh, carefully prayerfully is to rightly observe this passage with you uh, rightly interpret it, and then rightly apply it to our lives. So with that said, it's just one verse, but would you stand and give God your undivided attention as we read Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you all, it's a plural, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. The grass withers and flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Sorry, as I was reaching for it, I ripped it out of my Bible. Thank you. You can be seated and let's dig in. First, what is the main idea of this passage? And if we look at it in its context, that is, if we do what we did last week and we get a running head start and read chapter 3, verses 1, all the way down to verse 14, we see that the main thrust, the main subject, the main idea of this passage is not salvation or of people not perishing, if you look at verse 9, but the main thrust, the main idea, the main subject is the return of Jesus Christ. Now that's just observing I'm not using some smoke and mirror technique to make this passage say what I want it to say. I'm just observing. And I think you would agree with me if we look at verses 1 through, really go down to verse 15, uh, we would see that this is speaking of the return of Christ. Particularly the time of the return of Christ, right? This apparent delay. Why hasn't he come back yet? That's important because the main idea is the return of Christ, not salvation. Secondly, who is being addressed here? What I'm doing here is just what I try to do when I sit down and have my quiet time or prepare a sermon. I'm, I'm just observing information. Who is being addressed here? What are the pronouns well, in this chapter alone, look at chapter 3, verse 1, we see beloved, and we see your and you. Verse 3, we see there, 
Verse 5, they. Verse 8, your beloved. Verse 9, you and you all and all. And those are the pronouns. So we see that Peter was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to God's beloved. But, but there's another group there, and that's the they, the them, the there, and that's the mockers, right? He, we talked in depth last week about that. Um, know this, first of all, verse 3, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking. Verse 5, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water. So Peter is writing to God's beloved and he's going to call them throughout this you or you all, right? Y'all, all y'all, John. John likes that phrase, all y'all. All right, but the all y'all, again, it's very important. That's the beloved of God. That's not just all y'all as though he's going through a phone book starting with the A's and ending with the Z's. All y'all are all of God's beloved, okay? Um, go back to chapter 2, verse 1 for a moment. Well, excuse me, go back to chapter 3, verse 1. This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by, by way of remembrance. All right? So it's the second letter. We'll get to the first letter in just a second, but he calls them beloved. Let's look at chapter 2, verse, or excuse me, 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. And this is, again, the audience. This is the, the beloved. This is the you, the all y'all. Uh, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the same group. And now go back to chapter to 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Because he said, this is the second letter I've written to all y'all, beloved. Now we go back to chapter uh, 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1, and we see the very beginning of this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens or sojourners scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen or who are the elect of God. So who's being addressed? You could say it several ways. The elect of God the chosen of God, the beloved of God. And Peter will call that group, you, y'all, <laughs> all y'all, that, that's who he's writing to. Now let's look at the text again. So go back to 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not, let's back up to verse 8 actually. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward all y'all. That's exactly what it means in the Greek. Not wishing for any to perish but for all y'all to come to repentance. All right. So maybe you're starting to see something here that you haven't seen before. I know I did. But let's go a little bit deeper. And again, this is not a smoke and mirror question. This is something you're going to have to answer yourself in your Bible study. Does the word all 
mean every single individual without exception every single time it's used in our Bible. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it clearly doesn't, right? Let, let me use a secular illustration. If a teacher was taking role and she said, he said, are we all here today? Obviously, he or she is not talking about the population of planet Earth. Are we all here today? There's a, there's a context clue there, right? Now, if this same teacher in a different context said, all people benefit greatly from learning how to read and write, then that person does mean all people everywhere, red, brown, yellow, black, white, young, old, male, female, rich, poor, educated, not educated, all people benefit from learning how to read and write. In the Bible, we see similar situations. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Does Paul mean all who were in the room with him when he said that, but not those who are outside of the room? Again, the context. He, he's already said, Jew, Gentile, uh, no one seeks after God. No one is righteous. No, not one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So that he means all. There's several places I could have gone with this, but in the Gospel of Mark, for example, there's two passages that we read not long ago in our Bible reading, where in Mark 1, 5 and in Mark 1, 33, uh, the word all is used, but it is clear that it is not all the way Romans 3.23 is used. Listen to these two passages, Mark 1.5 and Mark 1.33. And all the country of Judea was going out to him and all the people of Jerusalem and they were all being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. It doesn't take you very much time to read through Mark 1 to realize that's not talking about every human being on planet Earth. Or even every human being in Jerusalem or Judea. Verse 33, similarly, and as he went out the whole city, all gathered at the door to hear him preach. So there are times that it won't make a lot of difference as you're reading through your Bible, but there are times when a specific doctrine is on the line where you've got to do some context clues to figure out, is this all or is this all? Because behind door number one leads to this conclusion, and behind door number two leads to a different one. And I'm arguing, and I think the context of Second Peter validates this, that Peter was writing a specific message of hope and encouragement, a promise of God that all of the elect, that that's where we're going with this, okay? John Sampson says this, Christ's second coming has been delayed so that all the elect can be gathered in. The elect are not justified by election. The elect are justified by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. If a person is to be saved, they must come to Christ in repentance and faith. The doctrine of election simply explains who will do so. The elect will. One other thing that we need to look at 
is this word wishing. In the New American Standard, it's wishing. In the ESV, it may be a different uh, word, desiring, willing. There are two main Greek words that are used to describe God's willing or God's desiring or God's wishing. Two, two main Greek words. Usually the Greek word thelema means to desire something. Whereas the word bulame means to decree something. I'm not making this up. I don't want you to just trust my word for it. Uh, you can find me afterwards if, if you want to know uh, how to gather some resources that will help you just see clearly uh, what this Greek word or that Greek word means. I thank God for my Logos Bible software where you can hover your mouse over it and it pops up and tells you these things, things I used to take me four or five hours to do in my Greek New Testament in college and seminary. Now I can just hover my mouse over and there it is. I said usually the word thelema means desire and bulame means decree. Not always. That's why you've got to look up their context. But in this case, that is what happens. The word used here for wishing or desiring or willing is the word bulame. And it means to decree something. Now, hang in there. This is going to get a little bit deeper but it's just for a second, and then we're going to come up for air. Theologians have, have taken what I just said and just their reading of the scriptures, and they, they've noticed that there's different wills of God. For example, there's the will of decree. I just mentioned that, the word bulame. And for example, Isaiah 46, 10, and 11 would be God's will of decree declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done saying my will will be established and i will accomplish all my good pleasure calling a bird of prey from the east the man of my purpose from a far country truly i have spoken truly i will bring it to pass i have planned it surely i will do it. That's God's will of decree. It's not debatable. It, it, it happens every time God exercises his will in that regard. There's no turning it back or, or, or shifting it. And you have God's will of desire. I mentioned that as well, the word thelema. Um, this would be called God's revealed will, or, or when we read the scripture and we see the commandments of God, thou shall not have other gods before me, you shall not lust, you shall not covet. It, it is God's desire that you obey his commandments. Matthew 7, 21 is an example. N not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will, there it is, the will of my Father who is in heaven, he will enter. So this will of God can be broken. It is broken all the time. God says, I desire, I will that you not commit adultery, but you do. I desire, I will that you not steal and lie and cheat, but you do. You with me so far? And then there's, there's one other aspect of this, and you could call this God's will of disposition. And I think this is important for us to look at today. Because although I'm saying that this passage is speaking specifically of God's elect, chosen before the foundation of the world, I don't think that gives us the right, and it doesn't paint an accurate picture of God if we then deduct, oh, then God just doesn't care about anybody else, or he, he does delight in the destruction of the wicked. Not true. 
So God's will of disposition. Uh, R.C. Sproul said this in the, um, the Essential Truths of the Christian Faith. He says, God's will of disposition describes God's attitude. It defines what is pleasing to him. For example, Ezekiel, and we'll look at this in a moment, Ezekiel 18, 23 and 33, 11, says that God takes no delight in the death of the wicked. Yet he most surely wills or decrees the death of the wicked. God's ultimate delight is in his own holiness and righteousness. When he judges the world, he delights in the vindication of his own righteousness and justice. Yet he is not gleeful in a vindictive sense toward those who receive his judgment. God is pleased when we find our pleasure in him and in obeying him. He is sorely displeased when we are disobedient and incur his justice. So listen to these verses. I shared them sort of, but let me just read them to you. This is uh, Ezekiel eighteen twenty three, and Ezekiel thirty three eleven. Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord, rather than that he should turn from his ways and live? Ezekiel 33, 11, say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked would turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? Lamentation 3, 20, or 32 through 33 puts an exclamation point on this. For if God causes grief, then he will have compassion according to his abundant loving kindness, for he does not afflict willingly or grieve the sons of men. That word willingly means from the heart. From the heart. So, again, looking at, at this information... Let's take it back to chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you all, beloved, elect, not wishing for any to perish, but for all y'all, beloved, elect, to come to repentance. The word used here is the word for God's will of decree. Since bulame means decree, we got two choices here. One would be God is saying, I decree that none without exception perish and that all without exception come to repentance. There's a doctrine for that. It's called universalism. And some believe that. They believe every single person on planet earth is going to heaven. There is no hell. And that is what that would be teaching if we didn't look at the pronouns. But since we have looked at the pronouns, this is what Peter is saying. All, without exception, of God's elect will hear the gospel, repent of their sins, believe in Christ, and be saved, and none will perish or to put it in the context, Jesus will not come back one second before the last of his chosen hear the gospel, repent of their sins, believe in Christ, and are saved. Does that make sense? 
Well, I'm giving you some things to think about. I don't want you to just say, well, well, Brent said, I want you to, so let's put it all together and apply it. First thing I want to just say, because you may hear this and go, again, wow, God cares about his people, but there's no, there's no mercy or grace or common grace even for those whom he passed over in his judgment. But what I want you to see, not particularly from this passage, but from the other passages that we've seen, is that God loves to show mercy. And God shows mercy every day, even to unbelievers who will never repent and believe in Christ. Again, this may not be the clearest passage to show that, but there are many other passages. Just, just jot a few of these down. I'm going to read these quickly. Joel chapter 2, verse 13 and rend your heart and not your garments. And now return to the Lord uh, your God, for he is a gracious God, a compassionate and merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and relenting of evil. Jonah 4.2, you remember Jonah, right? He prayed to the Lord, Please, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and merciful and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Psalm 86, 5, For you, Lord, are good, and you are ready to forgive. You are abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all, and his mercies extend over all of his works. All of them. You might remember when David was being disciplined by the Lord, he said, I give you three choices. You choose your discipline. And behind door number one was David would fall into the hands of man and let man mete out the justice of God. Similar behind door number two. But behind door number three was you'll turn yourself over to me, David. You'll turn yourself over to God and let me handle the matter. And David said, listen to this, 2 Samuel 24, 13 and following. Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land, or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and see what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to God, I am in great distress let us now fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hands of man. He knew he had a whooping coming. He deserved it. But he said, I, I'd rather you give me the whooping, Lord, not man. Because, God, you're a God of mercy. It's just God's character, it's his nature. Romans 9, 16, it does, I love this. Listen to the, the, the way the original Greek words it says, so then it does not depend upon the man who wills nor the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. But upon God who has mercy. Literally, it means the mercy having God. The mercy having having God. That's, that's what it means. That's a title for God. It doesn't depend upon man who wills or man who runs, but it depends upon the mercy hyphen having God. God will show mercy to each and every person who repents and treasures Jesus. Don't overthink this. We were talking in our new members class today of Sometimes we get in our own head and we start thinking, well, how do I know if I'm one whom God chose? 
Don't overthink it. Listen, do you know that you're a sinner in need of a Savior? I've got good news for you. There is but one Savior who died for sinners. His name is Jesus Christ. And if you will repent of your sins and trust and treasure him, you will be saved and you will show that God has elected you from before the foundation of the world. Jesus came for the sick, he came for the sinner, he came for the lost, and he delights to have mercy on any and on all who repent and treasure him. And as we've already seen, there's ways that we won't even understand till we get to heaven that he is showing and, sh and showering mercy upon even those who will not repent because he is a merciful and gracious God. David Matheson says this, many of us today are prone by nature or nurture to see God's mercy as peripheral or incidental to who he really is. We suspect that God perhaps shows mercy by accident or weakness. But if we let scriptures have their say, we will see that when God shows mercy, he does so with utter intentionality and strength. And we as his creatures get our deepest glimpse of who he is, not just in his sovereignty, but in his mercy. Not simply in his greatness, but in his gentleness. Not simply in the towering might that he displays, but in his surprising tenderness. Our God is not simply sovereign, wonderful as that is to celebrate. And he is not only a God of uncompromising justice, Thankful as we are that he is, he is the mercy-having God who invites us to look not only at his awesome authority and sovereign strength, but to set our eyes on his mercy and to see into his very heart. Entrust yourself to the God who has mercy, David Matheson pleads. So I would want you and, and myself to pray that this whole counsel view of God would move us to pray that God's heart, Christ's heart, would become our heart. That we would ache for and break for sinners who need the mercy offered in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray that this full counsel picture of God would move us and motivate us in our prayer life, in our missions, and in our evangelism. That's point number one, our second and final application coming straight from, I think, the right interpretation of this passage is this. None of the elect will perish. None. None. Or to put it a different way, as I've said already, Jesus is not going to come back one second before the final sheep is in the pen or the final family member is adopted into the family of God. In a very real sense, I can say that I'm thankful that God did not send Jesus Christ back on April the 11th, 1990. Those of you who know my testimony know that on April the 12th, 1990, I heard the gospel, repented, and believed. And that's how it is with God. He has chosen his people, and nothing can keep them out of his arms. Nothing. John chapter 6, verse 37 Excuse me just a moment. John 6. 37, I know that one by heart, so even if I didn't type it up like I thought I did. All that the Father has given to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will in no way cast out. John chapter 10, verse 16, I have other sheep who are not of this fold. They must believe. They must. They will so to answer the question that this text is really begging, and that is, why hasn't Jesus come back yet? That's really the thrust of this passage. Why has it taken so long? Now think about it. They were saying that 
about 30 years after Christ died and was ascended. Now we're 2,000 years saying the same thing. God, when are you sending Jesus back? Well, the answer is God is waiting in his perfect timing to gather every sheep into the pen, every elect into the family of God. And when that happens, then Jesus is coming. Doesn't that help answer a question that we brought up last week where it says, hasten the coming of the Lord, speed it up. And we thought, how in the world can we speed it up? Well, again, God has that day fixed, but he also has the means of that day coming fixed, which is you and I praying for, evangelizing, going on mission trips, sharing where we work, where we play, where we live, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and God works through his spirit to bring his elect into the fold. And when that happens, God's going to say, it's time, son. It's time. So far from being a passage that undercuts or contradicts the God-exalting, human, humbling doctrine of election, once we rightly observe this passage and once we rightly interpret this passage, this passage clearly and powerfully teaches election. What assurance we can have as God's elect. God chose you, child of God, beloved of God, Christian. God chose you. And nothing could, nothing will stop him from bringing you safely into his arms and into his family and into the flock. And nothing can prevent you from safely arriving in his presence in heaven. You are forever shielded from God's wrath because Jesus, your Savior and your substitute, drank the cup of God's wrath completely dry when he was on the cross saying, it is finished, paid in full. And it was proven by the empty tomb three days later. This passage this doctrine of election doesn't make us passive. The fisher of men, brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ, he has said, follow me and I guarantee you, you will catch some fish. I guarantee you, you follow me, you're going to catch some fish because I stocked the lake. I stocked the lake. There are fish ready to be caught. You follow the fisher of men, and I will make you a fisher of men. This passage, this doctrine doesn't lead to passivity. It doesn't lead to fatalism. This passage and last week's passage teaches us that through our prayers, through missions, through evangelism, where we work, where we play, where we live, we can actually hasten the coming of Jesus Christ. As I said again, as I said before, I'll say again, when the last sheep is safely in the pen, when the last of God's elect is one to Christ, the Father will say, it's time. Go get them, son. Go bring them home. You and I get to play a small but significant role in that. And I don't know about you, but that brings me great joy. We talked about joy this morning, that not are, only are my sins forgiven, not only is it well with my soul, but God uses me and he uses you to pray for and to spread the gospel, hastening the return of Jesus Christ. Mm, so good. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this rich passage of Scripture. Let us deal with this delicately and humbly and patiently with others who, who would just rip it out of its context and, and, and try to beat us over the head with it and say that our doctrine of sovereignty of God and election is, is wrong. Let us be patient. We too once were like that. We too once kicked against the goads. 
but you have shown us the sweetness of your sovereignty. You've shown us the magnificence of your mercy. You've shown us that your timing is perfect. Verse 15, we didn't even hit that, but it says, regard the patience of the Lord as salvation. Oh God, thank you that that you didn't send your son back on April the 11th. I would have been left out of the ark, drowning in my sin. But I'm thankful that you had people who brought the gospel to me. I heard the good news. You opened my heart. I repented and believed in Christ. And now I'm one of those who are heralding that good news as well. Thank you for doing that in so many people's lives here today. If there's any who have yet to hear the gospel in such a way that repentance towards God and faith in Jesus was their appropriate response, I pray that today you would do that work of grace in their lives. We ask it all in Jesus' name and God's people said, Amen. Amen.